We now look at Plato's famous line. According to Plato, there are two ruling powers because there are two worlds. The intellectual world, the world of the forms, is ruled over by the good. The visible world, the world that we live in, the world of particulars, is ruled over by the sun. As we saw before, they have uh, analogical functions. The sun illuminates the visible world, allowing us to see the particulars here. The good illuminates the world of the forms, I guess allowing the soul to, metaphorically speaking, see the forms. Now Plato, to show his layout of his metaphysics, and of course it also blends into his epistemology, presents the line, and it's pictured here. And so we're asked, in the Republic, you know, Plato's, uh, rather Socrates is talking, written by Plato, and he says, take a line and cut it into two unequal parts, then divide each again. So we end up with a line with four parts. Now the segments of this line are A, B, C, and D. Unlike the grading scale, A is the worst and D is the best here. So the world for Plato, or reality rather, it is made up of two main you know, components again. There is the intellectual world made up of lines, uh, segments D and C, and the physical world made up of B and A. So Segment A, for Plato, is the least of the segments, the worst. The faculty that corresponds to this segment is imagination. And the objects of this segment would be shadows, images, reflections, illusions. And interestingly enough for Plato, also art would fit here as well. It's not that like a statue would be like, you know, a you know image or shadow it's that it, in terms of it being art it'd be also be a physical object and hence in you know segment b as we'll see in a moment but art would be here as well because plato is very critical of art regarding it as problematic for a variety of ways uh, one being that it's in the lowest category and another is in plato's republic uh, book 10 he discusses how it corrupts so this realm is the least of things. They do exist, but just barely. Segment B consists of the physical things, and the faculty here is belief, things we have opinions about. And this would be the realm of physical objects. You know, again, as I mentioned, like in the case of a statue, a statue would be a physical object, so it'd be in B, but it'd be an image of a person, so the art part would be in segment A. Now the upper segments, the better segments for Plato, consist of C and D. And this is the intelligible world of knowledge. This is stuff you can know. So the lower of the segments is segment C. The faculty there is thinking, and the objects would be what Plato calls the lower forms, and also the mathematicals. Although Plato is not entirely consistent about this stuff throughout his dialogues, and there's some debate about, you know, later on, whether he accepts mathematicals, lower forms, etc. But in the Republic, where he presents the line, it does have these, these divisions. So what are the hallmarks of this level? Well, Plato notes that at this level, the mind uses objects in the visible world as a way to understand the intelligible world. That is, to give a concrete example, we use geometric diagrams to understand geometry. We use mathematical symbols to understand math. We use symbols and logic to understand logic. And so one key part of this is we use, we use symbols. Now the symbols aren't the thing, they stand for the thing. So in Plato's view, the geometric symbols are representing the you know, the mathematicals. The math symbols are representing the mathematicals. The um, logic stuff, I guess, would be the, it doesn't call it this, but I guess it would be the logicals. The second thing is, is that this knowledge for him is fragmented, and it's based on assumptions 
that are taken as self-evident as opposed to being based on a non-hypothetical first principle. And so what we do is we start off with assumptions and we move through a series of steps, you know, deductive logic. So the key qualities here are first, as I noted, we use symbols, and secondly, we engage in deductive reasoning, and math is a form of deductive reasoning. And so we go through a series of steps to reach our conclusion, so a process of you know, reasoning. The highest segment, segment D, has the faculty of rational intuition, and sometimes presented as reason of a special sort. The objects here are what Plato at this point called the higher forms. So how does this differ from segment C? Well, one difference is this. First, there is no reliance on visual aids. I mean, you could, yeah, you could, you could come up with like a symbol for justice or other higher forms if you wanted to, but we don't use those symbols in order to, you know, have knowledge of these, these higher forms. There's also no reliance on assumptions, and there's no reliance on going through a step-by-step -step process. So how does this work? Well, Plato says that you have a rational intuition of the forms, and you reach what he calls the first principle of the whole. Crudely put, you see the forms, not with your eyes, of course, but with your, I guess, your soul. And it's a form of, you could see it as being a form of enlightenment. So the good shines upon the forms and you understand them. You don't need the symbols, you, know, you don't need like mathematical symbols, equations, etc. And you don't go through a series of steps. You simply see the truth. Now this level of knowledge creates a lot of problems throughout the history of philosophy because other philosophers you know, except this idea of like seeing by the light of natural reason, people like Descartes, etc. And then you run into the problem of, well, how do you distinguish between seeing by the light of natural reason and just being, you know, insane or just being completely wrong, just being, feeling really sure about something? Because in segment C, you've got to do proofs. You've got to do the, do the work. At the highest segment, you just see it. And again, this lays the ground for a struggle in philosophy and dispute over how do you tell when you're seeing the truth and when one is just sort of totally wrong but really, really enthusiastic about this. So those are the segments of the, the line. So Plato's the good is this first principle of the whole. And it is the ultimate source of both knowledge, hence the epistemology, and reality, hence the metaphysics. And as, we, as we've seen on multiple occasions, Plato draws an analogy between the good and the sun. And so the good goes beyond the partial truths that, the, that words can convey. And you understand the good through a sort of enlightenment after supposedly a long period of instruction and close companionship whatever that means. Now again, the segment C is something that you can do proofs. In fact, that's what segment C is all about, advancing you know, mathematical proofs or logical proofs or geometric proofs. And the highest level D is essentially is you just become enlightened. And again, that's highly problematic because how do you have a standard of distinguishing between being enlightened and seeing the truth and just being someone who, say, is fanatical or um, has an entirely wrong. And the battle to sort that out continues throughout philosophy. We now turn to his allegory of the cave. So he describes the cave in the following way. There are people living since childhood in a cave with an opening towards the light. They're chained to seats in this cave and can only see what is before them. Above and behind them is a fire. Between the fire and the prisoners is a raised way for people to walk and a low wall. And people carry various um, you know, objects on sticks. 
They're carrying vessels, statues, and figures of animals which appear over the wall. And so the people chained in this cave can only see shadows thrown by the fire on the opposite wall of the cave. And when people see these things, they think they're naming what is actually before them. So they would, would say, for example, uh, horse, uh, cow, man, woman, etc. To them, of course, the truth would be nothing but the shadows of the images. Now, Plato is using this allegory, of course, because in his time they didn't have you know, virtual reality, they didn't have movie theaters, etc. But what he's presenting here, in a way, is kind of a movie theater of a very simple sort, where the show is just shadows you know, played on the wall and people making noises behind there. So what happens within this, this cave? Well, Plato asks us to imagine that one of the prisoners you know, breaks free from the change and is loose in the cave. Now, initially, looking at the light of the fire, because the person is only accustomed to the fire behind them and looking at shadows, would be painful and distressing. And now, the person can't see the realities which they had previously seen in the shadows. And Plato asks us to imagine this person you know, moving, you know, out of the cave. And the person, of course, will start approaching nearer to being as they start moving out of the cave. And their vision will start clearing. And, of course, the person will be perplexed if the instructor in the cave requires him to name the passing objects. Initially, of course, he'll think the shadows are the true objects, or at least truer than the objects that he now sees in the cave. Step two for Plato, the escape of the prisoner, is the person escapes from the cave and is out into the sunlight. Now the sun, of course, is even more, far more dazzling than the fire. So the person is, you know, dazed and pained by the light. And it'll take a while for the person to adjust to the upper world. First, they'll be able to see the shadows in this upper world, then reflections in water, then finally they'll be able to see things by the light of the stars and the moon, and finally they'll be able to stand the full light of the sun, but hopefully not staring into it. And the person will argue the sun is the cause of all that he has become accustomed to behold. And so this freed person would being in the light of day, seeing the sun, would praise himself and pity the dwellers of the cave. And of course, all the honors given in the cave to people who best handle the shadows of things, he would not care for those because they are simply the shadows of honors. If the person returned to the cave, his eyes, of course, would be full of darkness and before recovering, he would do badly in such contests. And he would seem you know, to not understand how things work and would seem sort of foolish and incompetent. And people looking at this person, this philosopher, would think it was better not to ascend because otherwise all learning all this stuff, all escaping the cave does is make one worse at winning the honors in the cave. So the allegory of course, since an allegory is this. The prison house, the cave, is the world of sight, the sensible world that we live in. The light of the fire is the sun, and the journey upwards is the ascent of the soul into the realm of the forms. And of course, in the Mino, we find out that the ascent is done, well, kind of by dying, but because that is how one communes with the forms. So laid out, the cave would look like this, with the corresponding, um, as you can see, to the four levels of knowledge. So being in the cave, this would be with the people being in chains. They would be using the faculty of imagination, seeing the images and sensations, this world of illusion. And they mistake the shadows and echoes as being real. So that'd be corresponding to segment A. When the person is loose in the cave, they have belief, they have sense perception, 
and the fire is analogous to the the sun of the world and this would be the realm of belief so they're still in the to use the allegory they're still in the physical world now escaping from the cave they get up to looking at our segments of the line up to level c these would be people who are semi-free they're beyond the cave and they understand the forms that are not connected to the good be mathematics the lower forms etc and as again as we noted before this is a level which one uses symbols and steps and deductive reasoning and then the highest level would be a person who's fully liberated using the special sort of reasoning understanding the ideas connected to the the good and the allegory of course the sun in this allegory is the good and so that's the layout of plato's famous cave if you ever seen the movie the matrix uh, sorry spoilers for this 1999 movie it's based heavily on plato's allegory of the cave also as we'll see in the future based very heavily on uh, descartes uh, you know his problem of the external world so very the first one very philosophical movie with guns lots of guns and of course explosions now the good for plato super important is the universal author of all things that are beautiful and right it is the parent and lord of light in this visible world and it is the immediate source of reason and truth in the intellectual the analogy of course and to god is fairly clear which is why some medieval thinkers occasionally claim that plato also aristotle were christians before christ uh, people who favor plato more than christianity might say that christianity you know borrowed played plato's idea others might say that plato was you know had this uh, idea but got it partially wrong and then christianity and monotheistic faiths later got it right or you know people take various approaches based on their beliefs so what if someone's seen the good well once someone's seen the good they would tend to be unwilling to get back into the the cave and if they do go back into the cave they will seem ridiculous before they get accustomed to the the darkness of the cave and if they're compelled to fight in courts or other places about the images and shadows of justice they will seem seem foolish because the people they're you know that would be say accusing them or contending with them would be using only the shadows of justice and they've never seen absolute justice and so this would be a bewilderment of the eyes coming out of the light into the darkness and of course one can become bewildered as well going from the darkness into the light and if a person you know remembers this when he sees someone whose vision is perplexed metaphorically speaking won't be too ready to laugh and will ask if if the person has come from a brighter life and hence cannot see in the dark or has come from the darkness to the day is dazzled by the excess light and plato says the one who is leaving the darkness will be happy the one who is entering the darkness will be pitied now of course he's foreshadowing the reference to the courts is of course what happens to you know socrates in the apology socrates on his view is arguing for true justice those who are attacking him are arguing at best for the shadows of justice now of course the republic is written um, after socrates's death so the foreshadowing is uh, not really foreshadowing so where do we get this knowledge from well as plato notes you can't put knowledge into the soul which is not there before to use an analogy because philosophers love analogies this would be like putting sight into blind eyes the soul already has the power and capacity of learning going again with the eye analogy he notes that as the eye was unable to turn from darkness to light without the whole body the instrument of knowledge can be turned from the world to becoming to that of being only by movement of the whole soul and learn to endure the sight of being and the brightest and best of being 
That is to say, the good. So how does this come about? Well, this art doesn't implant the faculty of sight. It already exists, but it's turned in the wrong way. So it looks away from the truth rather than towards it. And he notes that, using another analogy, the various virtues of the soul are analogous to bodily qualities. Even if they're not innate, they can be implanted later by habit and exercise. Our good dead friend Aristotle will also take this view. Uh, he wrote a work called the Nicomachean Ethics, and he discusses you know, how do you become virtuous. And essentially his contention is habit and exercise. So how do we get this virtue of wisdom? Well, he claims that it, this virtue contains in a divine element that always remains, and it gets converted and thus becomes useful and profitable, not in like the monetary sense, but you know, it's a good thing, or hurtful and useless. So what happens if they're hurtful and useless? Well, what happens is this. If someone, um, you know, instead of developing the wisdom in a way that is useful, they develop it in a way that is hurtful and useless, they become a rogue. And as he notes, the narrow intelligence flashing from the keen eye of a clever rogue, how clearly his paltry soul sees, it, sees the way to his end. He is the verse of the blind, but his keen sight serves evil, and he is mischievi mischievous in proportion to his cleverness. And so a Plato is known here, one that's picked up uh, later by other philosophers, is that the most dangerous of bad people are the ones that do have a developed intelligence, that do have this wisdom. But it, the problem is, is that instead of developing, you know, in accord with the good, it develops in an evil way, and the sight serves evil. And so the greatest of villains have some of the virtues, but not all. And for Plato, this is known as the unity of the virtues. And if we think of, you know, some of the best known uh, movie villains, they tend to be like this. They'll have many we consider positive qualities, you know, great force of will, great intelligence, cleverness, ability to plan, etc. But they're, they use the, these virtues in the service of, you know, badness and, and evil, because they're, they're villains. So that takes us to the end of Plato's famous line in Allegory of the Cave. We now look at Plato's famous line. According to Plato, there are two ruling powers because there are two worlds. The intellectual world, the world of the forms, is ruled over by the good. The visible world, the world that we live in, the world of particulars, is ruled over by the sun. And as we saw before, they have uh, analogical functions. The sun illuminates the visible world allowing us to see the particulars here. The good illuminates the world of the forms, I guess allowing the soul to, metaphorically speaking, see the forms. Now Plato, to show his layout of his metaphysics, and of course it also blends into his epistemology, presents the line, and it's pictured here. And so we're asked in the Republic, you know, Plato's, uh, rather Socrates is talking, written by Plato, and he says, take a line and cut it into two unequal parts, then divide each again. So end up with a line with four parts. Now the segments of this line are A, B, C, and D. Unlike the grading scale, A is the worst and D is the best here. So the world for Plato, or reality rather, it is made up of two main you know, components again. There is the intellectual world, made up of lines, uh, segments D and C, and the physical world, made up of B and A. So, segment A, for Plato, 
is the least of the segments the worst. The faculty that corresponds to this segment is imagination. And the objects of this segment would be shadows, images, reflections, illusions, and interestingly enough for Plato, also art would fit here as well. It's not that like a statue would be like, you know, a, you know, image or shadow. It's that it, in terms of it being art, it would also be a physical object and hence in you know, segment B, as we'll see in a moment, but art would be here as well because Plato is very critical of art, regarding it as problematic for a variety of ways. Uh, one being that it's in the lowest category, and another is in Plato's Republic, uh, Book 10, he discusses how it corrupts. So this realm is the least of things. They do exist, but just barely. Segment B consists of the physical things, and the faculty here is belief, things we have opinions about. And this would be the realm of physical objects. You know, again, as I mentioned, like in the case of a statue, a statue would be a physical object, so it'd be in B, but it'd be an image of a person, so the art part would be in segment A. Now, the upper segments, the better segments for Plato, consist of C and D. And this is the intelligible world of knowledge. This is stuff you can know. So the lower of the segments is segment C. The faculty there is thinking, and the objects would be what Plato calls the lower forms, and also the mathematicals. Although Plato is not entirely consistent about this stuff throughout his dialogues, and there's some debate about, you know, later on, whether he accepts mathematicals, lower forms, etc. But in the Republic, where he presents the line, does have these these divisions. So what are the hallmarks of this level? Well, Plato notes that at this level, the mind uses objects in the visible world as a way to understand the intelligible world. That is, to give a concrete example, we use geometric diagrams to understand geometry. We use mathematical symbols to understand math. We use symbols and logic to understand logic. And so one key part of this is we use, we use symbols. Now the symbols aren't the thing, they stand for the thing. So in Plato's view, the geometric symbols are representing the, you know, the mathematicals. The math symbols are representing the mathematicals. The um, logic stuff, I guess, would be the, it doesn't call it this, but I guess it would be the logicals. The second thing is, is that this knowledge for him is fragmented and it's based on assumptions that are taken as self-evident as opposed to being based on a non-hypothetical first principle. And so what we do is we start off with assumptions and we move through a series of steps, you know, deductive logic. So the key qualities here are first, as I noted, we use symbols and secondly, we engage in deductive reasoning, and math is a form of deductive reasoning. And so we go through a series of steps to reach our conclusion, so a process of you know, reasoning. The highest segment, segment D, has the faculty of rational intuition, and sometimes presented as reason of a special sort. The objects here are what Plato at this point called the higher forms. So how does this differ from segment C? Well, one difference is this. First, there is no reliance on visual aids. I mean, you could, yeah, you could, you could come up with like a symbol for justice or other higher forms if you wanted to, but we don't use those symbols in order to, you know, have knowledge of these, these higher forms. There's also no reliance on assumptions and there's no reliance on going through a step-by-step -step process. So how does this work? Well, Plato says that you have a rational intuition of the forms and you reach what he calls the first principle of the whole. Crudely put, you see the forms, not with your eyes, of course, but with your, I guess, your soul. 
and it's a form of you could see it as being a form of enlightenment so the good shines upon the forms and you understand them you don't need the symbols you, know, you don't need like mathematical symbols equations etc and you don't go through a series of steps you simply see the truth now this level of knowledge creates a lot of problems throughout the history of philosophy because other philosophers you know accept this idea of like seeing by the light of natural reason people like Descartes etc and then you run into the problem of well how do you distinguish between seeing by the light of natural reason and just being you know insane or just being completely wrong just being feeling really sure about something because in segment c you got to do proofs you've got to do the do the work at the highest segment you just see it and again this lays the ground for a struggle and philosophy and dispute over how do you tell when you're seeing the truth and when one is just sort of totally wrong but really really enthusiastic about this so those are the segments of the the line So that segment, there is no reliance on these visual aids uh, and 